Alright X, I've got a weird story to tell you guys. I don't come to this board often at all, but this seems like the right place. Be me. Serving in prison for street racing. Yeah, I know, it's fucking stupid. I did it once after getting pressured by my friend. Got caught immediately. Two months in, get a new cellmate. Nice enough guy, but scared of everything. Mumbles to himself. Get to know him. Turns out, he's a paranoid schizophrenic. Wakes up screaming some nights. He tells me about his delusions. He knows that he's fucked up. Except them, man. I know they're not delusions. I'm not fucking crazy. I see those eyes every time I close my eyes. I'm never gonna unsee that red light. Starts rambling about how they come for him at night. And he got himself in prison to stay safe. Won't tell me what he did to get locked up. Dodges the question every time. Fast forward a month. We become friends and he opens up a little. Tells me how he used to never sleep because that's when shit would go down. When he would start to doze off, his body would start to feel really heavy and he'd get a vibrating sensation in his limbs. Like a heavier, slower version of the way you feel when your legs fall asleep. A humming noise will start out quiet and get louder and louder and a bright white light fills the room and then it slowly turns blood red as the hum reaches its peak like a skull splitting tinnitus. Says he usually blacks out after that but not always. Sometimes I see them. They don't want me to remember. Ask him what he means. Starts describing fucking greys in great detail. I didn't believe in aliens at the time, so I thought he was totally nuts. Short, with limbs longer in proportion to their bodies than humans. About 4.5 to 5.3 feet tall. Grey, almost see-through skin. He said it looked more like a membrane than it did human skin. Massive black eyes that reflected everything like a mirror. They smelled almost like a burning phone charger. I asked him about the smell, but he just shrugged, said it was hard to describe, that it didn't really smell like burning plastic and wire, but it was the only way he could word it, since he'd never smelled anything quite like it before. Says he's getting uncomfortable, that talking about them for too long makes him anxious to go to sleep. Next day, we had art therapy. <laughs> Fucking stupid, right? And he gets all twitchy and starts drawing creepy shit. Gonna continue in the next post. We start art therapy. Basically, we do it to let our feelings out. Because it's supposed to help people be less violent or something. I don't really know. I just start doodling. I'm usually a pretty chill guy and I don't really have anything on my mind. Danny, my cellmate, seems to enjoy these sessions for the most part. Even though he's not very good. This time it's different. Super anxious. Says he was up nearly all night. Even though I was up late. And I didn't hear him make a sound. Keeps scratching his neck obsessively. Constantly chewing on his forefinger. Looks on the verge of some sort of panic attack. Therapist tells him to try and draw what's upsetting him. Stares at the paper and charcoal for like half the fucking session. And then starts feverishly drawing. Fills the entire page with shades of red. Can barely make anything else out. Looks vaguely like a bedroom. Can see a blurry doorway. What looks like a bed. Maybe a dresser. It's all messy. You can see three figures near the bed. Blurry except for the eyes. Huge, pitch black, almond shaped eyes. They're surrounding the bed. With a staticky stick figure. Danny? In it. Screaming. Therapist asks him to tell him what it is and he just mumbles about a nightmare. I'm typing this in between answering phone calls from customers, but it's a slow day, so I'm doing my best to post fast. Ask Danny about the art later. Tells me it's usually what happens when he sees the greys, but his therapist tells him it's a nightmare or sleep paralysis. Nightmares don't leave marks. He turns around and shows me the base of his neck. There's a faded scar. Small. Perfect circle with a triangle of three dots in the middle. What. The. Fuck. 
He says he's woken up after nightmares with bruises in strange places on his body and other triangles made from dots. Therapist claimed it was just him self-harming in his sleep or sleepwalking. Bull shit. It's time for lockup. Don't feel like sleeping, so I get in bed to read. On the first page of a new book, when Danny suddenly sits up, freaking the fuck out and yelling, Dude, what? I ask him what the fuck happened. He said that they came for him and took him away. Now I know he's fucking nuts. Tells me to look at the time. There's a clock you can see from outside our cell. It's fucking four hours since lockup time. I was reading the same page that I started on four hours ago. There was no way I fell asleep or anything. That was one of the creepiest things that ever happened to me. Danny said losing time is common, but that he didn't see me on board. Why the fuck would I lose time too? I've got more, don't worry. This isn't the end. Get really, really freaked out. Don't want to believe him. Get checked out by the prison doctor and psych, just in case I'm losing my shit, but they say I'm fine. Get cleared, so I just pass it off as dozing off while reading and not realizing it. Couple weeks go by as normal. Going the yard, art therapy once a week, go to the library, etc. Prison starts letting inmates have chalk in their cells so they can draw or write or whatever, and it can't be used as a weapon. Danny starts drawing the faces of the greys again, and drawing odd line symbols that are like dots with lines, kind of like constellations. This is near the end of my stay, think it was within the last month or so. Been waking up with headaches, nosebleeds some days. Not exactly strange, they can be side effects of the allergy medication that I take. Looking forward to getting out, Danny still has a while to go. Still don't know what it was for or how long. We stay up late one night, drinking shitty prison wine. The idiot who gave it to us fucked it up, and it tasted like vinegar and piss. But it got us fucked up. Drink till we're on the verge of passing out, when suddenly Danny freaks out. Shit, fuck, fuck, do you hear that? Anon, please tell me you don't hear that. It's the humming noise he mentioned. Oh, fuck. The noise gets louder and louder, and a higher whine can be heard over it, and Danny is pounding on the jail cell door, screaming for help. No one comes. No prisoner tells us to shut the fuck up. No guard comes to slam their baton into the bars. What the fuck is happening? A bright, pulsating white light is filling the prison, searing my eyes. Suddenly turns blood red, and everything goes dead quiet. So quiet, you can hear the blood rushing in your ears. I try to hide under my bed. Can't move. It's like I'm made of lead. My body is buzzing like it's made of fucking bees. Start to panic. Want to scream for help. Ask Danny if he's okay, but I can't even open my mouth. Get the sudden feeling of being watched. In the glow of the red light, I can see shadows on the wall. Shadows start moving around. Suddenly I feel a sharp pain in my head and get a mental image of myself frozen in the cell with Danny a few feet behind me. It was like someone put a camera in the cell and I was watching. Image was gone, but I could sense something was next to me. Everything goes cold and the vibrating gets worse and more violent, almost as if the cells in my body were being thrown around. I can feel myself being lifted off the ground. Close my eyes and even though I'm not religious, I start to pray. What else am I going to do to anything that will listen? The red light is seared into my retinas. I'm screaming inside but nothing comes out. Suddenly I'm in a room. It's steel colored with no light source, but evenly lit to the point of no shadow. The next thing I see is the eyes Danny mentioned. They were fucking horrible, massive eyes that took up like a quarter of the face. Almond shaped and slanted like 45 degrees. It was pitch black. I could see my own terrified reflection in them. Those massive, wet black voids 
reflected every inch of terror in my face. Those things didn't look even remotely human. No drawing or photoshop or mask has come close to how awful those things were. The waxy, membrane-like skin almost pulsated. Images flashed through my head. Me and Danny, the aliens, the prison, pictures of planets, organs, stars. It gave me a massive fucking headache. I don't know what it was trying to do. Suddenly I'm in the prison hospital. They found me on the floor of the prison cell, with a blinding headache, lying in a pool of my own vomit and blood pouring from my nose. They found Danny huddled in the corner, sobbing, shit his pants, covered in scratches and bruises. Doctors and guards questioned me. They thought we were fighting, even though no one saw or heard anything. Anything at all. No one heard our screaming, the lights, or the humming sound. How the fuck? Told them that we got drunk but didn't fight or anything. I had no idea what happened to Danny. They released me in time for dinner. My head still pounding and my whole body aches, especially my neck. IV helped but I wanted to get actual food in my body. Danny wasn't in the cafeteria. Didn't see him for another three days. Danny tells me they questioned him, asking why I attacked him. He says the wounds were self-inflicted, that he had a nightmare, and he clawed and hit himself in his sleep. They kept him under observation to make sure he didn't try and hang himself or something. Neither of us want to talk about what happened that night. All he asked was, You saw them too, didn't you? I nodded. You know they're not going to let you go now, right? Once they set their eyes on you, you're in their sight for life. Been drinking, so typing is going slower, so I make sure I don't fuck up so badly. I think I might look for the pictures he sent me. I know I have them around here somewhere, and I think I have some letters from him too. Obviously creeped the fuck out. Neither of us sleep well for the next weeks. Nothing major happens until a few nights before I'm out. Mostly headaches and nosebleeds. Go to sleep, wake up in the middle of the night to the humming noise and bright red light. Please, God, no. Not again. I can't take this again. The humming died down and the red light fades away. I breathe a sigh of relief. I realized it was probably just sleep paralysis. Used to happen to me as a kid, but I'd just seen the old hag. Fall back asleep. Wake up to the sounds of guards yelling at me and slamming open the door. They tell me to get up and spread up against the wall, hands up. What the fuck is going on? Stop barraging me with questions. Where did Danny go? How did he get out? Did you help him? What? Keep telling them I didn't do anything and I don't know anything. They bring me to a room to interrogate me more. After a few hours of the same shit, they let me go. Talk to some other inmates who were in my cell block. They didn't see anything either. A guard who was friendly told me the cameras caught nothing either. It's like Danny up and vanished. Danny was gone for three days. Cops put out an APB for him, thinking that he escaped. On the last day, some convicts found him in the wreck yard. His foot somehow pinched in between weights that were already on a bar. He had to go to the prison hospital for dehydration and some broken ribs, as I found out later. They never found him on footage on any camera, so there was an investigation to see if there was a cop trying to get inmates out. I don't know if anything ever came of that, but I know for a fact this wasn't the cops. There is no way he would vanish without a trace and then reappear clipped through fucking metal. I never got to see Danny again. I left the day after he came back. He wrote me a few weeks after I left, telling me the night he vanished, he saw the red lights again, and he hoped it would be the last either of us did. But we both kept seeing them. I don't have it happen often, but Danny probably does. Looking for his letters now, he had a few stories. 
The only sounds are the buzzing, lights and paralysis. Sometimes I hear almost a musical sound in my head. It's not really a tune or singing or someone humming. It's almost like it's the idea of music. It's strange. Not sure if it's in my head or something I actually hear. I honestly don't know what they've done to me. I don't have clear memories of what happens after the lights. I don't think they strapped me to a bed. They seem to paralyze me. I can't move anything besides my eyes. It's horrifying. I don't know if it's out of fear or something they do to you. I doubt you could even move a finger against one. Despite the frailness of them, they radiate a kind of power that I've never felt before. Here's a letter from Danny that he wrote to OP. Hey OP, hope you are doing well. I'm sure not. They're talking about sending me to the psych ward now. They think I'm crazy. If I were, then I'd think so too. But you've seen what I've seen. You know how real this shit is. You're just as scared as I am. Remember that night we saw the red light? It happened again. I started praying to God a few weeks ago. I asked him to protect me from this evil, but instead of angels coming to deliver me, they did. I remember every single thing they did to me. They hurt me. They put me on a table. They cut me open and stuck me full of glass and copper and glowing tubes scanning me and probing my organs. I saw it all, every little bit. I thought I was going to die, but they made sure I did not. I passed out. I woke up with no scars or wounds. I don't know how much more I can take. I want to die. At least in a psych ward, it'll be hard to kill myself. As afraid of them as I am, I'm scared there is something worse on the other side. Take care. Danny. P.S. Here is one of my drawings from therapy. Keeping them scares me, but it feels wrong to throw them away. Here is both the letter and the drawings that Danny sent side by side. Be me. Living in a little blink and you'll miss it town in a shithole country. I work at a PC repair store, but we do more general electronic repair related stuff. I actually have very little knowledge about the shit, but almost everyone in this town is a boomer, and you'd be amazed at how many people come in complaining about their broken PC, and it just turns out it's fucking covered with dust, and after a good cleaning, it works like a charm. If it's not that, you can be sure they downloaded some shifty shit online, and you can just run some antivirus software, and problem solved. Anyway, I'm at work like normal, when the local head cop walks in. Sheriff equivalent, I suppose, and tells me he needs some help with some tech-related stuff on a case he's got. Sweating Pepe.jpg. Like I said, I know very little about this stuff, but once you've ficked a boomer's PC or laptop or phone one time, they think you're a fucking savant. Get permission from boss to go help. Go to police station. Have to sign some shit about how I'm like an IT advisor on the case or some shit. He starts asking me if I saw any weird things around town recently. Weird? Eventually, he slides me a smartphone. Tells me some local girl went missing, and her friend says she got abducted by aliens while they were making blogging videos of some kind, and he needs me to find them so he can watch them. The way he said aliens was very... sardonic, and I think he both just assumed she was freaking out or something. I'm fucking dead inside as I scroll through this phone. We got the password from the friend. Somehow she knew it. I realize I'm literally just here to find the video on her phone and click play. There were a couple different folders with videos, and this boomer cop honestly didn't even know how to find it, and thought he needed some IT genius to hack into the phone or some shit. So I'm going through the different folders, trying to find the most recent video. Whole time the cop is telling me what happened. I honestly think there must be some sort of law against that, like, he can't just tell me about this case and these people involved. But when you're in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, people don't really care too much about the rules. If the family wants to sue him for that shit, I imagine they'd have to take him to the nearest city, because we don't even have a proper courthouse. Anyway, I'm half listening, as he tells me about how the phones at the police station were going crazy last night, 
and how people were calling in about lights in the sky and people prowling around their gardens. Apparently, some guy even heard his door handle rattling as someone tried to open his back door. I'm just like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, that's crazy. I was drinking and watching anime last night with my headphones on, so I didn't hear any of this shit. Every video is just this girl, sometimes with her friend, talking about some K-pop band they like or cooking and doing recipes and shit. All the videos are like 3 to 5 minutes long. Eventually find a video that's 10 minutes long. 10 minutes exactly. I imagine the phone automatically stops at that point. And skip to the end and it's just like 2.5 minutes of nothing. Phones just pointed at the ceiling fan. And then it cuts off. Bingo. Track back to the 3 minute mark. Girl is lying on her bed, talking to her friend. It's a split screen and her friend is just chilling at her house, I'm guessing. They're talking about some shit. Super forced and awkward. I think they were uploading these to YouTube or TikTok or some shit in hopes of becoming famous. Missing girl eventually stops laughing and gets this terrified look in her eyes. I say her eyes because her face was barely moving. Looks like she had a stroke or something. She's really still, but her eyes are really panicked. She must have had the phone leaning on something, because it didn't move at all. At this point, the cop has shut up, and has moved next to me. So this girl is lying there, looking like she's got a gun to her head. Imagine her phone lying to her right, by her head, probably propped on a bedside table, as it records, so we can see over her, and out of her doorway a bit, but most of the room is off screen. Her friend starts asking what's wrong. Girl's eyes are darting like crazy now. I think she was trying to say, I can't move, but it was from out of the corner of her mouth and really mumbled, really looked like a stroke victim. Video goes on like this for 30 seconds. Her friend is clearly scared, but obviously doesn't want to freak out in case it's a prank. I would have thought it was a prank, but I notice one little tear run down her face. This girl is clearly terrified. Eventually, hear floorboards creaking outside girl's room. Light from hallway gets a bit dimmer as someone walks in front of it. Oh shit, that JPEG. I'm about to watch some fucking serial killer walk into this room and take this girl. Feels like fucking CSI Miami. Girl's eyes are fixed on her doorway. They are bulging to the point that they look like they're about to pop out. Figure appears in the doorway. Very tall. Very dark. Quite wide across. Literally needs to turn shoulders to enter through the doorway. For some reason, the fact that it looked right first, the wrong way, into the other room, scares me. Like, it just gave this very human element of searching the rooms for someone. Honestly, wasn't even thinking at this point. I was just watching this shit like I was completely detached and this wasn't even happening. Like when you're dreaming, but you realize it's a dream. There are three of these things, and they enter one after another. The best way I can describe these things is that they look like a mix between an owl and that thing from Spirited Away. No face is the name, I think. Imagine that thing, but with an owl's head instead of a mask. But also it has a little lipless mouth instead of a beak. They get closer and I realize that those giant black ovals where the eyes are supposed to be aren't dark feathers, like how an owl tricks you into thinking it has giant eyes. These things actually have massive fucking eyes. The biggest difference between these and normal aliens is how big they were. The heads and eyes were massive, but not really disproportionate to the bodies. Looked like pick related, but they were wearing clothes like no face. Black shawl looking things made it hard to tell what their bodies looked like, because it was just a solid black mass, but definitely clothes, and clearly the bodies under them were huge. We just sit there, fucking dead silent, as these things walk towards the girl. Her friend has been screaming the whole time. They stand over her, and I notice that she's screaming too, but it's muffled, and coming out the corner of her mouth. It's like I'm honestly watching somebody have a sleep paralysis episode. 
They reach out. Hands and arms are very stereotypical of grey aliens. Slender and pale. But when juxtaposed with those huge bodies, they almost look like tentacles. Two of them literally pick her up like she's a sack of potatoes. Like they don't even look her in the eyes. They carry her out of the doorway. The one in front makes quite a big bow to ensure she doesn't hit her head on the ceiling. Weirdly, the camera doesn't move during any of this, but after the two of them are gone, it suddenly gets knocked over, and we can hear quite a lot of clattering. I guess the third one did it. Cop literally whispers, there was signs of a struggle. I guess for my benefit, or maybe the story was just making sense in his head. We just sit in silence for the next three minutes, as the video rolls while pointed at the ceiling fan. That was basically the end. I left the police station like I was a fucking ghost, just wandering around, and I never got called back. The girl was never found, and the whole town just seems to have gone, huh, I guess she got abducted or something. I don't know if anyone else saw the video, and I never told anyone but my sister, but the whole town knows the story now, and I imagine about half believe it. I think the video probably still exists, and I've asked the cop about it, but he just says he can't give me case evidence. Suddenly he fucking cares about the rules. I don't think any men in black came and scared him or anything, and I imagine he's shown it to a few people. My one friend told me the story in perfect detail, even though I never told him. That phone is probably sitting in a desk drawer right now, about five kilometers away from me but I'm not about to go break into a police station to prove it to anyone. I think the official story is that she got kidnapped by three dudes in masks. Anyway, I still think about that girl sometimes. Her fucking eyes looking at those things, and the way they looked at the wrong doorway first. Fucking awful. This is going to be long. I have told this to people I am close to, and they think I'm crazy. But I am confident in myself that what has happened and what is happening to me truly did occur and is not the result of a malfunctioning brain. Something truly extraordinary and special happened to me when I was a young boy, but few people believe me when I say it. I want to tell you all here because this board is dedicated to the paranormal and what I have to say is patently paranormal. Nonetheless, some of you may not believe it. A few years ago, in the early half of 2020, I experienced a strange episode of recollection of a paranormal experience that happened to me when I was 13. This event in my life began with me receiving a text message from my mother's cell phone that read, All my life, I have struggled with correct behaviors. Then I started to remember what happened to me. In short, I think that in my past, when I was a young boy, I became telepathic, and I communicated with cosmic entities, communicated with God and extraterrestrials. I was kneeling by my bed, praying to God as a Christian, when I became psychic, and a voice answered my prayers, and they explained to me they are the galaxy we inhabit. The galaxy is a living, non-corporeal entity. I told them I wanted to communicate with God the creator of the universe, and they explained to me that this entity I call God is not the same God as I was taught by my mother. Nonetheless, I wanted to speak to God. The galaxy connected me to God, and God spoke to me. I told him I wanted to serve him, and God said he wanted to be amused, and that I would suffer for his amusement. I agreed to this, that I would live another life to suffer for his sake. Then, when I was 13, I encountered space aliens while I was playing one of my computer games. There was some discussion I don't precisely remember, but there was an offer by them for me to go with them for the duration of the summer hiatus from my schooling, and I accepted. I went with them on board their starship to a place outside the solar system, where they put me into an artificial lucid dream state with their technology, and I would spend my time with them in this manner. These star people I met have psychic abilities, and they are much more advanced than humans. They have the ability of future sight, and while I was with them, 
I was physically connected to my future self, and I was living my life as I would in my 20s. As I type this, I feel the connection to my past self, and I can feel them communicate with me, but I do not hear them. When my time with them was finished, they returned me to Earth, and I was killed by them, putting my body into a machine like a meat grinder that is used to destroy cattle and turn them into ground beef. Yet my life was restored, and I live again. But I'm living through all of this again, and I am deeply troubled by this. That is my story, with some details missing. In before, take your meds, schizo. Let me start off by saying, I hate role-playing threads and acts, and you can choose to believe this or not. Story is set over a period of 20 years. Be me. Live in small rural area in Oklahoma, between Tulsa and Bottlesville. County has been experiencing weird sighting of black triangles and cloaked people walking down rural roads. Cows disappearing and blood and organs being found in fields. Live on a ranch with livestock. B14. Chilling at house at night, during the summer, playing Super Nintendo. This was early 96, so N64 was not released yet. Game room was sunroom that overlooked land, and in the distance, if it was clear, you could see the Tulsa skyline that was about 30 miles away. Get up to go get an RC cola. Walk into sunroom and see what looks like people by our pool on the bottom of the hill. Mind you, our house was built on a hill to overlook our land. Oh shit, my little brothers got out again and are trying to swim at night. Leave sunroom and proceed to go out to the back deck. Start walking downstairs to pool at the bottom of the hill. Notice these figures are small and skinnier than my brothers. See baseball bat on staircase landing halfway down. Grab it. Feel my adrenaline pulsing. Walking toward pool which feels like forever. Try to say something to the figures. Barely let out a word. They hear me. They turn around and stare at me. They have large eyes and grey skin. Start to hear static in my head. Feels odd. Start counting them. There are four. Try to raise bat. My arms feel like they are jelly. Hearing what seems like distant whispers in my head. We are not here to hurt you, unless you mess with us. Starting to feel like I am congested. Start slowly walking the 60 feet to the pool. Bat is raised, might be able to get a good swing in on them. Try to swing, miss the creature. Start feeling weak. Sit down and accept my fate. Hear footsteps on the concrete around the pool, and hear the gate move. Look around, they are walking away. See the light from the TV is on in the sunroom. See one of my younger brothers in his pajamas lit up by the light from the TV. Sit there for a few minutes as I regain my strength. Slowly walk up back to the house. Feel warm for my face. My nose is bleeding. Walk to bathroom when I get to the house. Washing my face off and contemplating on waking my dad and stepmother up. My younger brother walks up behind me and says, You saw them too? They have been coming around here for the last few months. That's why I draw the blinds when it's evening now. A few months back I was reading Hank the Cowdog, and I looked up, and one of them was staring at me from my window, and I felt a loud buzzing in my head. Then it just disappeared. I look at him, and the dots of his odd behavior are adding up in my head. My brother continues to say they mostly walk around outside the windows and try to peek into the windows. They know we are here, but they are trying not to mess with us. Does dad and we will call her Sue, stepmom, know about this? No, I don't want to tell them. They might think I am crazy. Well, let's keep this to ourselves. I go back to the sunroom and turn off the TV and run back to my room freaked out. Lay in my bed all night until the sun rises, unable to sleep listening for movement outside. When my father wakes me up, I tell him I want a rifle. His eyes light up. What for? I just want to plink and walk the land with it. Of course, son. Go to the tractor supply store 
and get a cheap SKS from a barrel and some ammo. Now I am prepared for these guys. Weeks go by and nothing shows up. Until. Be a few weeks later. Playing my new game Quake on DOS. Computer room is in the front of the house. The room is a computer slash informal dining area with a window, with the benches built right underneath it. Sun is going down in the Oklahoma sky. Anxiety starts setting in. Draw blinds. Play about an hour or so and start feeling an odd feeling on my back. My back is to the window. Stop playing for a second. Start listening to the sounds. Hear the doe theme playing and then I hear what sounds like movement in the bushes outside the window. Gather some bravery. Peek behind the curtains. See two large all black eyes staring at me. Panic mode enabled. Run from the window while yelling. My dad gets up and I hear him running. He comes into the room with a loaded 1911. What is it, son? There's something outside. He walks out the front door and I hear, Holy fucking shit. He runs back in and locks all the doors and draws the blinds all over the house. Everyone get to my office. We do and my dad walks in a few minutes later with a few sleeping bags and a few rifles and some food. I hear him try to call his co-workers, my father is a deputy, and tries to call my stepmom who is out of town for a conference. No service. Dad comes in and rounds up all five of us. I have four brothers. Tells us that what is out there looks like a grey and begins to explain to us what it is. Tells us all to stay in this room all night. Dad randomly patrols the house. Brothers fall asleep. I fight it but end up passing out around 1.30am. Wake up because I think I hear knocking on the window. Look around and see all my family is asleep. Even my dad is asleep with a chair in front of the locked door. Hearing rain, assuming it's rain on the windows. Knock, knock knock. It's coming from the window. Look out and see nothing. Hear cans fall from the direction of the garage. Dad is alert, locked and loaded. My brothers wake up crying. I forgot to lock the fucking garage, my dad screams out. Dad hands me SKS and tells me that he will lead. We slowly walk the length of the house to the garage. Hear movement in the garage. Sounds like cans are being thrown about. Dad reaches for the door handle and quietly unlocks the door. Here we go, dot JPEG. Open the door right as lightning flashes. Door swings open. Garage is lit up. The door is open. Dad turns on the lights. The wind blew the door open and was scattering cans around the garage. Woo, dot MP3. Go close the door. Look outside and see something run past the door about 100 feet away as another bolt of lightning flashes. Close the door and tell my dad. Start hearing soft buzzing. Start hearing slamming on the garage door. Then I hear my brothers screaming from across the house. Dad and I run toward them as we both lock garage doors. Run to the office. Something is slamming on the window. Tell everyone to get out and we all run toward the master bath with a walk-in closet with all our stuff. Banging goes on for another hour in various places. Throughout the outside of the house. Doors, windows, and walls. Until all we hear is the rain and distant thunder. About 5am, my dad and I start turning on all the lights in the house. Patrol the house and wait until the sun rises. Sun rises. We peek outside and nothing is there. It's a dreary morning. We walk the perimeter of the house and see little footprints and my dad has a Polaroid cam. Take pictures and prepare to cook breakfast. My brothers wake up scared. We reassure them and tell them it's okay. Dad tells them not to tell mom and that we will make sure the house is safe. Fear consumes the house for the next few weeks. Nothing happens. School begins and all is well. Fast forward two years to when I was 16 and edgy. B16. Working on the property and feeding the cows. Multiple cows are out in the pasture. About 10am in the morning. I walk towards the cows with my SKS slung on my back. and notice they are standing by a creek bed, mooing like they are lamenting something. 
walk toward creek bed where the cows are standing. Smells like hospital and rotting flesh. See three cows mutilated and a calf fetus still with the umbilical cord attached, floating in the creek. Run back to the John Deere Gator and call my dad on the walkie-talkie and tell him to call the sheriff and to come here. Flash forward an hour, deputies taking pictures and coroner looking confused. Hear a Crown Vic roll up and a few guys in slacks and button up shirts walk up and identify themselves as Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation. Start their investigation and they call a college vet to come pick up the bodies for investigation. They drive off with the cattle bodies and we go on our way. And that night I have to stay up and patrol the property on an ATV and make sure nothing goes wrong while my dad stays at home by the phone in case I call for help on the walkie. Be around 10 p.m. Driving my ATV down a dirt road Hear a car rolling down the road. It's an all black Crown Vic. As they drive by, I notice two men in all black in the front. They stare at me as I wave at them as I pass. Go about a mile down the dirt road and hear a buzz just like the one I heard two years before. The hairs on my neck stand up and I see something slowly move across the sky and hover over a house down the road and then move on then it shoots all the way up. I sit there in awe for 10 minutes, hear jets in the distance. Two jets fly over me, probably from the Air National Guard base in Tulsa. They make two or three passes. I drive on and for the rest of the night, see or hear nothing. Spend the rest of my weekend with no issues. Go to school on Monday and everyone has seen the black triangle and knows what happened on our ranch at my school. People are saying it's a common occurrence, but the Air Force and the Feds are keeping it quiet. Flash forward one year. B-17 and getting ready to graduate high school. Preparing to enter the Oklahoma National Guard. Still working on the ranch and keeping my eye out for odd things. Late evening and I am driving my beat up 1986 Silverado with my girlfriend, who is the stereotypical 90s goth girl, listening to Pantera on a black road in Oklahoma, being edgy and different. We stop on an isolated part of my family's ranch, start a bonfire and pull out a 12 pack of Lone Star beer, drink some beers and get drunk. Bang a gong, we're getting it on, looking up at the stars while the fire dies, hear buzzing, ignore it. Hey, do you hear that? Says my GF. Yes. She looks at me. I hear it all the time at my house. I think it's just the electricity from the power lines. Stars black out over us in the shape of a triangle. She is screaming and hurrying to put her clothes on. I put my pants on and we run to the cab of the truck. I struggle to start the truck. Crank it a few times. Finally it starts. Start hauling ass towards the road, shifting gears like a boss. Bust through a barbed wire fence and look in my rearview mirror. See triangles slowly following us, hauling ass down this country road trying to get to the highway to be around other cars. See storm following behind the triangle, about a mile to the highways. GF screaming for me to go faster, not in a good way. It's raining so hard right now. Pushing my truck to the limit. Sea bridge I have to cross is flooded. I tell my GF to hang on and I make a sharp left turn into a field and check my rear view mirror and see the triangle is still following us. Make sharp right turn back onto the road and see the highway. Relief.jpg Get on highway. Still hauling ass. See blue and red light on other side of the highway. Cars on the other side of the road are stopped and people are staring in awe at this triangle. I cut through the median toward a few stopped sheriff cars. They are in awe. The craft stops and hits a crazy amount of speed and flies off. The deputy looks at me and says, Hey, your deputy and on son, right? Yep. Was that thing chasing you? Yes, sir. Holy fuck, kid. From where? 
near Ramona. That's like six miles, kid. I am still in shock. My GF is crying. I drop my GF at her house in the shadow of a mesa in a trailer park, a poor rural area. Drive home and my dad has been told that I was being chased. He listens and tells me I did the right thing. Go to school the next day. That's all they can talk about. I graduate high school and go into the National Guard. Fast forward to 2003 when I get home from Iraq and I am going to college and working part time as a corrections officer at the local jail. Get home from Iraq. World is different. Killed a few Iraqis. Go to my part time job at the sheriff's. Get moved from the jail to patrol. Badass.jpg Having a typical boring evening shift, sitting in my patrol car, listening to classic rock. Eric Clapton.mp3 Dispatch calls. 843, we have a call about a person hanging around in a ranch, etc, etc. Go to call because I am unit 843 and it's probably just a bored kid wandering on someone's property. Starting to fucking rain. Get to residence, put on my rain jacket. Fucking dumbass call, I say to myself. Walk to house, knock on door. Sheriff's department. Door cracks open. It's near the barn. Short little fellow. Probably a kid that's wandered onto my property. Lol, okay, this is an easy call. Hearing thunder in the distance. I can hear some ACDC coming from my car subtly. Walk toward barn. My radio is starting to squeak and getting choppy. Fucking rain, I say to myself. Hear a footstep near the barn. Hey kid, it's the sheriff's department. I'm gonna need you to come with me so we can take you home. Walking stops. Hello? Kid, it's the sheriff's department. Walk around to the side where I hear the stepping and pull out my mag light because the sun is going down fast. Huge fucking black eyes reflect back at me. My eyes are watering and my head is buzzing. My radio is making a moaning sound and my head is buzzing. I hear it walk toward me. I see it walking toward me and I pull my 1911 out of the holster and pull the hammer back with all my strength. You missed with the stick. You're going to miss with that. Rings in my head. I put my head down. Buzzing stops, and I look up, and nothing is there. I put the hammer back on my 1911, and my radio is back to normal chatter. 843? 843! We have reports of a large triangle near your call. Are you okay? 843! I get on the radio. I'm okay. Dispatch is going nuts. We called your number for the past five minutes. My radio went to shit because of the storms. Dispatch, cancel officer non-responding call. Hear like five patrol cars rolling down the road to my position with sirens and lights. Walk back to the house and tell the lady it was just a deer. From the front they look like kids. All my co-workers are worried as they turn around and drive back. 843, we have a civil disturbance at address. I am on it. Driving the seven miles to my next call. I hear various radio calls about the setting of a black triangle and focus on my call. I get to the call and it's a familiar place. It's where my GF from high school lives with her parents. I knock on the door. I hear yelling. The door opens, it's her mom. Oh hey Anon, someone put you in a deputy outfit or did they think you were sane enough to be a cop? Ma'am, I don't have time for this shit. She tells me my ex is having violent fits and outbursts and I walk toward her room, in the trailer, and hear yelling and screaming. I open the door and see her thrashing on the ground, and drop to my knees and try to calm her. Anon, they know who you are. Who? They do. The things. We saw the triangle, and they are trying to get to you with me. I look at her mom, and she tells me she was diagnosed with bipolar depression last year. What do you want me to do, ma'am? as I look at her. Take her to the hospital. Maybe a few weeks in a padded cell will help her. Call dispatch and use the I have a 5150. 
was just Cali police slang, but now it's just police slang. Handcuff her and put her in the back of my squad car and begin to drive to the nearest city. She is talking to me and telling me that they know my younger brothers are my weakness. My radio is going off with reports of multiple F-16s flying over the area and a black triangle showing up after they, RTB, and then they scramble them again. Get to hospital. Leave her there and continue on with my shifts the next few weeks. Get a phone call at 3am four weeks later. Hey Anon, your ex hung herself in the hospital. She left a note saying that you were being watched and that they are after you. Everyone laughs it off. I don't and tell my father and he looks at me. Son, they are here every night outside and your stepmom is in denial. This was the 90s and the early 2000s. We have Polaroids of them, but they are at my father's house. I am not too sure where they are, and I also have a few other things too. Dad is literally sleeping four hours a night, and walking the house when he is up at night. My stepmom is taking Xanax, and working her rounds at the local, rural healthcare clinic, like nothing is happening. Fast forward two years, and I am finished with my associates and I am working full time at the sheriff's department as a corporal. No happenings lately. One day during someone's shift, they call me and tell me they found a girl that was missing, naked in the woods, rocking back and forth. She has been missing for one week and was found by a few hunters. The girl was talking about big eyes and grey little men. Investigators are treating this as a sexual assault because they see signs of traumatic sexual activity and other bruises. Take her to the hospital and Homeland Security took over a rape case and took us off the case. Homeland Security goes to our headquarters and starts taking reports and evidence from every call about cattle mutilations and black triangles and odd sightings. Then tell us any future calls need to be notified with the Homeland Security office in Oklahoma City. Fight breaks out between feds and sheriff's deputies in Motorpool. They keep screaming Patriot Act as we fight them and one actually pulls his sidearm on us to make us all stop. He says if we continue, all of us will be stripped of our post certifications and blacklisted from policing for the rest of our lives. I fall into a deep depression and drink about 8-12 to 12 cans of Lone Star every fucking night. Become a functioning alcoholic. Work my shifts. They're all meth heads and domestics. One day around 2007. I was working the night shift and it was 1.30 at night. And I was chilling on a back road taking a piss. Feels good man dot jpeg. Hear the piano exit of Layla playing over the radio. Nice clear Oklahoma night. No worries. Hear a thumping in the distance. I have heard this before. Digging deep in my memories. Thump, 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 thump. It's getting closer. That's a fucking Black Hawk heli. Get in car, turn off lights as it gets closer. Heli flies over. Leave all my lights off and begin to follow heli. Following heli for about 20 minutes. Our beats are fucking huge. Heli lands in a wooded opening near a nice new house. What the fuck? See multiple black SUVs and a lone sheriff car with the deputy sitting beside it, looking like he is being scolded by some homeland uniformed officers. I turn on my driving lights and wait for the deputy to pull out so I can talk to him. Deputy comes out and I wave him down and he tells me to follow him. We drive about two miles away and make sure we are not followed. He tells me that he got a phone call from our LT about a person peeping in the windows of a house and went to investigate. He told me he went to look and about five minutes later some DHS guys rolled up and told him he had no jurisdiction at this case and detained him for a while. I connected the dots in my mind. DHS is there in less than five minutes and uses a fucking helicopter. They must have a place they operate from in the country and they must be listening to our calls. Finish shift and go to my father. Tell him what I think. He says, yep, 
That's the issue. We are meddling in something they don't want us to know. Lay low for a few years and just be officer friendly. B-2010. Met a woman and married her. She works as a general surgeon in Tulsa. I am still bebopping around my sheriff job, wearing my khaki and my cowboy hat, common deputy uniform in Oklahoma. Working my beat, it's raining and I am thinking about quitting this job and moving to Tulsa and working the urban beat. Sitting at a railroad track while In Bloom by Nirvana comes on. I think back to being a teen and think about my GF who killed herself and all the crazy moments. Dispatch to 843. This is 843. We have a missing child case at address. Reports of the little girl following a fireball. It's around the 4th of July and fireworks are shut off a lot in the country. I put my Crown Vic in drive and make my way towards the address. I am greeted by one of my younger brothers, who is now a deputy, and the parent. She is talking about how the whole house lit up, and an orange ball shot through the house, and his daughter started to follow it, and she points in the general direction towards the forest. I look at my brother, and he looks at me, and he has a face that I have not seen in about 15 years. A face of fear. We tell her that we will go into the woods once another deputy comes and is able to stay with her in case the child comes back. Third deputy shows up and me and my brother turn on our mag lights and walk into the forest. We walk about 300 feet into the forest and our radios go nuts and my cell phone battery dies as I try to make a call to dispatch. Fuck it, I yell to my brother as we go deeper into the forest. I start hearing help. It sounds like it's echoing, and I whisper to my brother. You hear that? Yeah. It's not a voice. Well, it is, but it's in our heads. Help. It sounds like a distorted child's voice. Our flashlights die. Fuck, these are fresh batteries. Ah, blasts over the radio, before it beeps that it's dead. Help. We both sit in the forest and wait for our eyes to adjust to the darkness. By the way, I went to ranger school around 2006 for a promotion. Help. I pull out my SIG 226. 9mm if you want to know. I whisper, let's move up. We move up about 200 feet. Help. Start to hear a soft buzzing. I hear actual crying about 500 feet to my front. Help me and on. I look to my left, and my brother is right beside me. Why did you call for help? That was not me, but it said your name. Help me and on. Move up, bro, I whisper, getting closer to the crying, right on top of the crying. The girl is in a dried creek bed, bloody and cut up. I jump into the creek bed. She whispers to me. They are watching us. Hey, Anon, something is up here with me. Run, bro, if you have to. Help me. I hear my bro start booking it back to the tree line. And now in my mind I can hear, Help. And a buzzing. I cannot climb out of the creek bed, because it's about ten feet up. Walk with one hand holding my pistol, and the other holding the girl. Hearing leaves move above the creek bed. Then you, bro. Silence. Start hearing a clicking noise. Hear something drop behind me. Turn around real fast and it's a rock. Turn around again and hear, help. Start booking it to a place where I can run up the creek bed. Clicking sounds are falling behind me. Still hear running behind me. Run about 500 feet down. Run up the creek bed. Start running towards the tree line. An orange ball of light flies past me. I start to hear running towards the front of me, and I see ten flashlights, and I start running towards them, and notice there are ten deputies with AR-15s. Come on and on. I am running the fastest I have ever in my fucking life. Help. Reach the line with the deputies, with the AR-15s, and their lights start to fail, and their radios beep, and then the night goes dark, and a humming goes over us and blocks the stars. Six orange balls 
fly up towards the craft, and it speeds right away as two F-16s fly over. We all walk towards the squad cars and hear a helicopter on the horizon, and it flies over and places a spotlight where we were, and three DHS SUVs pull up. Blah blah, Patriot Act, blah blah. They have those little radiator detectors, and they beep when they scan us, and they run towards the forest and begin looking. Go through SOP and make it home at 8am, and crack open a nice cold RC, and rest, but only for a short time. My wife and I had two children, and she ended up leaving me for a banker in OKC. B2014, living in a nice trailer in the country on my family's ranch, and still working at the sheriff's department. B1 night, I am watching some shitty late night variety show. Hear a knocking on the window. I didn't hear anyone drive up. Grab SIG. Check window and nothing is there. Power goes out. Shit. Dot JPEG. I got some Gen 3 NVGs from the Federal Police Aid program, and I kept them because we had no use for them. Put them on. My dark wall turns green. Walk to my room and put on boots and find a can silencer for my SIG. Gonna fucking end this. Quietly make my way outside. It's eerily quiet. Check my perimeter. Change things up and go the other way. Knock knock from the other side of the trailer. Make my way quietly toward the other side. See grey man trying to peek in my window. Yell, help me! Thing looks at me and screeches and starts to run off. I give chase, not thinking to fire at it. Full of anger. Been fucking with my life for the past almost 20 years. This motherfucker can run. Speed up as I attempt to catch up to it. I am gonna kill you, motherfucker. Creature is running towards the ranch house. I see the outside lights of the house as the hill comes into view. Odd, my house is without power. Running towards the creature, and all of a sudden, it runs under a security light and blinds me. Take off my NVGs and try to readjust. Start to see spots in my vision. Fucking shit. Vision comes back, and I am looking at the pool. The creature is looking back at me. Feel my pockets and feel a baton. I flick it out. Walk toward the pool. If I lay one lick on you, you better never come back. Those empty, soulless eyes just stare back at me, and I hear buzzing and my nose bleeding. Extend baton. Walk towards creature. Whack, whack. Land two on its head, and it lets out this blood-curdling scream. Then I kick it into the pool. Hear it struggling to keep above water as it slowly swims toward the stairs. Walk to the stairs and spit in its face. Land one good whack on its head again, and then feel a burning in my body and hear a buzzing. The lights go out, and I cannot move. Four creatures show up and drag the wounded one away. The craft flies off, and I collapse my baton, and hear my dad running down the steps. Anon, you okay? Yep. Walk home. Sleep. Fast forward to 2016. I am now remarried and still working at the sheriff's, but we have had no odd cases reported in two years. Also, I will post Polaroids in a few days once I find them to back my story up. That's the Washington County Osage Reservation sightings. Fucking shit OP. Those sightings gripped the counties with fear for months. I always thought it was odd that DHS cars were rolling around in rural Oklahoma and F-16s flying over almost every night for six months. What happened to the girl? Did she make it out? What did she have to say about what she saw? Or did HS take over at that point? Until you can get Polaroid scanned and posted, can you post pics of your uniform, some of the pool, your yard, etc. The girl is fine. I think they moved to Oklahoma City after that incident. And the local media reported it as, Girl found and none of that spooky business. And I plan to be at my father's this weekend. And I will post if this thread is still here. Photos of my house and the ranch. And I can post a photo of my FDO and I real quick. I am on the left, the tan tall one. I still can hear the ringing sometimes. Got some juicy info for you ding-dongs. 
I'll start off by saying I don't give a fuck if you believe this or not. For the ones that actually want to know the whole secrecy behind why intel of the A's slash UAPs have been hidden for so long, I got some red pills for you. We apparently have never made contact, and it's been a back and forth speculation on what the UAPs are and if anyone or thing is actually in it. We do have materials for various crashes, but there have apparently never been bodies in any of them, hence the intelligently controlled phrase that gets tossed around with UAPs. There are reports of seeing entities within the UAPs, but descriptions never seem to match, and there hasn't been any photographic evidence of the entities, so it's still a toss-up on whether or not it's factual. Pretty much since World War II, top brass of the US military have concluded the A's slash UAPs are either angels or demons in the Judeo-Christian sense. They seem to come to this conclusion due to the fact the UAPs seem to be constantly observing us, like the Watchers in the Judeo-Christian sense. The top brass that thought it was angels stemmed from the idea that everything is being recorded for the Biblical Judgment Day, evidence that you'll be shown and comprehend. This leads into different top brass thinking it was demons instead, since there were various attributes displayed in reports that mimic various religious demonic attributes. Ability to induce paralysis, multiple entities able to get in someone's head, advanced knowledge that leads to human corruption of power. This back and forth went pretty much until AATIP was in the picture. When they got involved, they did deep digging into religious stories and beliefs about other beings and came to the conclusion that there are other entities out there that are intelligent, that are either made of or can operate on some sort of vibration slash energy slash macro Bose Einstein condensate. It was initially decided, slightly after World War II, that it was in the people's best interest to not know angels slash demons are hovering above us right now due to mass panic calls from confirming heavenly hellish entities exist. They also did not have 100% concrete evidence and felt it needed more research and confirmation. There have been many leaders that wanted to tell the public, but it has apparently been rebuttaled with the probability of causing a holy war. Christians, Muslims, Jews, all claiming their religion was right all along, and then eventually causing a massive war. Once again, we have never made contact and do not know what they really are, but we do know the entities exist, as do these strange vehicles. You mean aliens aren't from distant planets and are actually just interdimensional beings who have been here since the beginning? That's the exact conclusion AATIP came to. They aren't sure if it's interdimensional, although it was the best explanation for the UAP's abilities to seamlessly travel through space, air, and water. Ancient people see shit, can't talk to it, call it supernatural. Modern people see shit, can't talk to it, call it supernatural. It's almost like people are too stupid to be worth talking to. Almost. That could be the case, but I was told it was more like being on a safari. You'll watch animals kill others, and even though you have the ability and technology to save that animal, via guns, traps, loudspeakers, etc., you'll still just observe and not disrupt the natural balance of things, nor get out and attempt to communicate and explain what we know reality to be. I believe you will pee, but then Hitler must have had this intel too, so why would he kill himself then if it means straight to hell? Top brass didn't brainstorm this idea until after World War II. The US military noticed quite a bit of UAP reports and decided to dig deeper. I'm sure if Hitler was privy to this information, it would be the reason why he would heavily get into the occult shit. AATIP thinks that these entities are the reason for ghosts slash cryptids reports, and people's imaginations just run with what it may be. Angels, demons, aliens, monsters, ghosts, etc. When Roswell crashed, our government set up a meeting with the aliens from that race. They came here, met with Eisenhower, and gifted him with a device that could show the whole history of Earth, and we made a treaty with them and set up Area 51 in the secret space program. They have bases here, and we have bases on their planet as well, as on the moon, and Mars and lots of other places. Some A's are good, some are bad. Some are actual physical beings from other planets. Some are interdimensional, 
Some are both. Some even look human, and some are human. The ones that are able to be in contact with us are obviously way more advanced than us. There's no such thing as demons because the concept of a demon comes from religious dogma and mythology. It's not even a real thing, neither is hell, just do a little research. I'm 100% sure you're wrong about this setting up a meeting in the device. We do not have military bases on the moon, nor Mars. Your descriptions of the A's are close to being correct, from what I understand. However, AATIP believes they are just one species that can fuck with our perception, become invisible, appear to split off slash be two places at once, ability to change its appearance at will, similar to us being able to wear costumes and trick other animals, except that it can be done with the UAPs and theorized with the A's. Literally all of our technology in the last 300 years has come from aliens. You wouldn't have a phone in your hand or a computer if it weren't for them. The concept of the transistor actually came from recovered material. The top brass that fell into thinking it's demons also thought that UAP technology contained the historical forbidden knowledge by its ability to drastically increase knowledge, like the internet, and gain power slash control or even be godlike with its abilities. Where are you hearing this from? I was contracted through a defense contractor during COVID that worked directly with AATIP to assist with the studies. I cannot express how much I don't give a fuck if anyone believes this. I pretty much spilled the beans on the stuff that we all were debriefed on initially, but I won't go into any specifics as to which department, what I did, nor everything we learned. I just thought you ding-dongs would get a kick out of finding out about the elephant in the room lol. I know someone that works for NOAA. The disclosure rumors are 100% true, and the species in question is aquatic. I don't expect anyone to believe me, and that's fine. I know a lot of BS gets posted here for shits and giggles. I'm just sharing a story from a few weeks ago that I feel is relevant due to all the disclosure talk. I have a college friend that landed a job working for NOAA in a pretty high capacity. I won't say more than that to protect their privacy. Around the holidays, me and said friend were catching up, and they shifted the topic to aliens. This friend is very level-headed, and we usually don't talk about stuff like that. It's mostly family talk and work. They asked if I believed in aliens, to which I replied that I'd like to, but we simply don't have enough evidence. Their expression perked up, and they said, I'm going to tell you something, and I want you to take me absolutely serious. Okay, where is this going, I thought. They never seemed so intense in a conversation before, so I braced for some kind of huge personal reveal or something. But they started talking about the Russian submarine incident that happened not too long ago, where supposedly a fire broke out on board a nuclear-powered Russian sub and killed everyone on board. They said that was a cover story that Putin came up with, for whatever really happened. The sub was apparently investigating an underwater base that is controlled by non-human entities. They got too close, and the sub was destroyed by these beings. My friend went on to detail that most world governments are aware of their presence, yet keep it undisclosed because of the ramifications to society it may have. Also because we can't do anything to stop or forcefully reveal them. They told me that NOAA has had thousands of incidents of contact with these underwater beings, and that is fairly common knowledge among certain departments and roles in the organization. They said they have witnessed video, audio, and physical evidence of these beings residing under our oceans, but it's kept under tight wraps by senior officials and whatever government sector controls NOAA. The friend said that the recent disclosure buzz is legit, and had been carefully planned. They said they don't know exactly what details will be provided to the public, but that in general, it will be made known that there are other beings occupying our planet, and that they are not from another planet, but have been here long before us. They also said these beings actively keep us out of certain parts of the oceans. Apparently, their technology is advanced beyond anything we could come up with to withstand or negate the insurmountable pressures at extreme ocean depths. 
They are able to freely enter and exit the water in their craft without displacing or disturbing it physically. They've been captured innumerable times on sonar. Traveling at speeds underwater that are impossible as far as human technology or marine biology is concerned. They also mentioned a place called Lake Vostok and said a very large base was discovered there under the ice and that Russians have control over the operation there. My friend also detailed that they have been witnessed outside of any craft, swimming in the ocean freely by submersible divers and cameras at the bottom of oil rig platforms. They are humanoid and resemble what most people would call the typical grey alien. Oversized head, large dark eyes, no visible ears, small mouths. It's not known how they breathe or move underwater. That's pretty much the most of what I was told. They didn't give a date, they just said it will definitely be this year, according to what they have been hearing. Apparently, this is going to be a worldwide disclosure, not a US specific thing. Hey X. First of all, I want to apologize about my English. This is not my native language. So, I've been on this board for two years or so, always loved reading creepypasta, nopes, etc. I like to be scared. It makes me feel alive. So, this is my story. It happened two weeks ago. This is the first time I'm writing it down. So, I never experienced anything paranormal really, but still really loved all the things related to paranormal. You can say I really was searching for proof. I've had this mini obsession since I was like 13 or 12. Today, I'm 21, a soldier in the IDF. Sorry, I got carried away a little bit. Let's get back to the story. So two weeks ago, on a Sunday afternoon, me and a friend, also a soldier, decided to do something because we were both bored as hell. We are both on a vacation, so what the hell, right? So we took my car and just said to ourselves, let's just drive until we get somewhere. I live in the southern part of Israel, like an hour drive from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So pretty much after 40 to 50 minutes of driving, we found ourselves driving on a lonely road without any signs to indicate that people are around. Then we saw this big sign in front of us. On the sign it said, the big crater, 15 kilometers. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the big crater. In Israel, there are three craters. Ramon Crater, the Big Crater, and the Small Crater. You can Google them and read more info about them. So, the Big Crater is the most scary, most bizarre, and the most paranormal out there. We've never been there before, but we heard about the stories, so we just wanted to give it a chance. Just before the Big Crater, there is a really small town called Yerahem, a real shithole, and well, the town folks are just fucking weird. All of them look lifeless, never seen such a dead town. And after you pass through the town, another 10 minutes of driving, and then you enter the big crater. Before you enter the big crater, there is the most amateurish looking sign, and that looks kind of old. But we could understand a few of them that said, go back, don't enter, the evil is lurking. We just lolled and went through. Oh damn, I wish. I turned the car around in this moment. Sorry about that. So anyway, before you drive down to the crater, there is these two big fucking hills that gives you the feeling that you're in a hallway. And well, I just felt like someone was looking at us, at my car, while we're driving into the unknown. My friend just gave me a look that said, I know what you feel bro. So at this point I just felt really uncomfortable. So those two hills are disappearing behind us and we see the big crater for the first time. I shit you not, it looks like Mordor. We're driving down the road and at some point, we decide to pull over and take some pictures. And we're looking down and we see all those ruined, burned cars. So, who knows what happened to their owners. We just get back to the car and drive down until we get to the surface of the crater. Scary shit. The place makes you feel like you're in a hole to hell and the sand had an unusual color black. So after four to five minutes, 
I then notice that my car is not driving on a road anymore. I'm stopping the car and getting out and the road is just fucking gone. Me and my friend are trying to figure out what the fuck happened. Behind us, there was only desert and hills, but no road. My friend tells me to call the police. I didn't wait a second, but when I dialed, this horrible static noise just fucked with my ear. When my friend tried, he got the same noise. So at that point, we are like shitting bricks. We just go back to the car and try to dial the police again and again, but the static noise was just getting louder and louder. Fuck it, just drive in any direction, we will find the road. Yeah, we should have stayed at the same spot, but we didn't. Fuck. So I drove for not more than 200 meters and the car fucking died out of nowhere. I didn't know how I didn't just shit myself in that moment. My friend just started yelling at me. Did you do that? Really dude, don't fuck with me. Man, I'm fucking scared. But I calm him down and try to explain to him that I didn't do shit. It's hard trying to calm down your friend when you're scared as shit. When I looked at the car to find the problem, nothing. The car was in good shape. Nothing wrong with her. What the fuck? I knew I saw it. A pair of silver eyes looking at me. I just know I fucking saw it. I didn't tell my friend anything because he was scared enough. I tried to calm myself down. You're seeing things, too much X, and your brain is playing mind fucks on you. But I couldn't remove my eyes from that top hill where I saw those two football shaped eyes. I'm really shaking right now, just thinking about it. We stayed in the car for about 15 minutes or so. I'm not really sure. My friend then just steps out of the car and says, Let's go, dude. We will find the road and maybe not, but I really don't want to stay here. I looked at the hill where those big silver eyes had been and thought to myself, Fuck the car. We walked for about half an hour, and at that point it's really dark. Our only light is the moon, and that feeling, fuck. That feeling that someone is watching you every step you take. We then came across a small stone building. My friend looked at me and asked, Want to go in? Fuck no. There's probably some wild animals there. He just walked right in there while I waited outside, looking around to see if the big silver eyes followed us. Dude, come here. I heard my friend's voice. I went inside the building. It was no more than three by three meters. Inside there was this wood table. On the table, a fucking skull that was put on a pile of sand or ash. I didn't understand what that stuff was, but the skull, I didn't know what kind of skull it was. It didn't look like a man or any animal that I know. By the way, this really happened and in the end, I'm going to tell you one of the biggest secrets of mankind. We took photos, but I will soon explain why we don't have them in reach. And if I could take photos of the craters from the sky, I would post them. There was a real weird smell coming from the weird sand slash ash. Like a smell of rotten lemon. That's the best way I can describe it. Well, let's get the fuck out of here, man. But he just stood there, staring at that skull. Man. There's something weird about this place. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Let's get back on the road. We walked in an unknown direction. I just prayed that I'd see the road. That the shit noise when you're calling someone will disappear. Fuck. And then we see this light coming from the end of the hill. A really slight light. We get into position, like we learned in the army, and sneak towards the light. So we're at the end of this small cliff, and beneath us, there is this object in the size of a normal truck, all in white and in the shape of an egg. And it's just floating in the midair. And it's spreading a lot of blue slash white light. My friend looked at me and said, Dude, what the fuck is that? Have you ever seen those kinds of things? He asked me because I'm a soldier in the intelligence of the IDF, and I've seen all kinds of weird shit, but never anything like that. We then saw five to six men, well, we thought they're humans, walking in blue hoods but kind of blue like I'd never seen before. We're watching over these things that look like humans, but they were taller and their skin was more, I don't know, pure? Their eyes, big 
and silver. Now I know what I saw. One of those fuckers patrolling or some shit. They just stood there talking, like they were waiting for something. And then I saw the light of a car. Yes, yes, a fucking car coming from the distance. There were like free cars. Army cars. I saw plenty of them. The car pulled over really naturally. Like, they were used to seeing this egg-shaped thing floating in midair. Out of the cars came some soldiers and some uniforms. There were eight soldiers in total, all of them officers. The highest rank was a colonel. Me and my friend just looked at each other amazed. The colonel had a dark green beret, which is intelligence. He just stood there and looked at those things. And then told something to one of the other officers that walked back to one of the cars and dragged out some dude and pushed him towards those things. I noticed this dude was on his knees. The things created a circle around him. And then, those horrible bloody screams. He fell down and rolled. And me and my friend and those things and the soldiers we were all just staring at this poor guy who looks like someone is ripping his brain out. And then it stopped. The things get back to their original position, and the dude walked to the colonel. The colonel started to ask him stuff, while looking at the things. And the guy replied, I wish I could hear better. And I realized, the guy is a translator between the things and the soldiers. I can feel my friend is shaking next to me. The translator had to do this weird ritual again, and again. Every time those aliens or whatever stood around him, he started to scream in pain. Those cold, bloody screams. Why the fuck does he keep doing it? It doesn't seem like they force him, or maybe they are. He is now pale. Almost as white as those alien things are. And he's sweating. He goes back to the colonel. He does this again and again for about half an hour. I don't know why we didn't run for it. We were more scared than I could describe, but probably except for the soldiers and the poor guy, nobody will ever see it again so we couldn't miss the chance. And I know that my friend was thinking the same. So after half an hour or so, the soldiers and the dude entering the car, and they just drove away. And after that, we didn't see the brake lights, then it started. Suddenly, those things looked up to exactly the point where me and my friend were hiding. Fuck. Fuck, fuck. They know we're here. Come down. We are not gonna hurt you. We are going to bless you. Those five different voices in my head said it at exactly the same time. I knew my friend heard them too. Hey guys. I'm the Anon who was talking about being abducted and or shifting dimensions a few days ago. I wanted to give you an update. If you weren't here, I'll give you a rundown. On the night of March 12th, I was awoken in a very bright room with insectoid looking alien things examining me as I was strapped to a table naked. I struggled, but they told me not to panic and to calm down. But what I heard was nonsense babble. I somehow understood them. I must have passed out because next thing I can remember, I was in my bed the next morning. Except, my sex was changed. I talked to my friends and my parents, and nobody believed me, thinking me a female all my life. I answered some questions and talked about it with you guys, hoping for answers or a way to fix it. A lot of people came up with a lot of ideas and theories of what actually happened. Some said I really was abducted, others said I simply shifted dimensions in my sleep, and that the aliens were a dream. Others said I was always just a chick, who went crazy or the aliens changed my memories, or something to that effect. One very kind and helpful Anon explained that meditation, self-reflection, and recording any changes was a good start to getting more info on the situation. So here's what I've been doing over the past few days. I've been meditating, and while it hasn't really given me any real insight, I'm a lot calmer about the situation, and can, at the very least, accept what happened as reality. I'm not going to believe that I'm just crazy, and that all my 22 years of memories are a lie, because it would crush my soul, and I'm too scared of that. I also asked my friends and family a bunch of questions, to see if anything else had changed. I found a few minor things, but 
not much I can connect the dots with. One of my dogs has a different name. Was called Banner, but is now Ricky. My grandmother is dead when she was alive, lest I remembered, which I am sad about. Other than that, just a few things here and there are different other than my clothes, ID and photos taken. At this point, I can't say for certain that this is what happened, but shifting dimensions sounds the most likely candidate. A few reasons for this. First off, aliens probably do exist out there, but I highly doubt the likelihood of them coming anywhere near Earth statistically, so that's the aliens being real ruled out for me. I study physics, so the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, while it does have some holes, does have some solid math behind it, and given the fact that other small things have changed, this seems like the best conclusion to make. I mean hell, problems like quantum immortality and the like are still genuine thought experiments that stem from the many worlds interpretation. So if true, it's not like it would be unlikely. But tell me what you guys think. I'm not the expert in shit like aliens and dimension shifting. That would be you guys. Oh. And there were also a lot of real creepy messages and people asking for stuff as proof. Which I provided but I realized was probably a mistake. Which got me into trouble with the Jannies. So, I'm not gonna going forward. If you don't believe me, that's fine. Go about your day and leave me be, and if you do, please, only ask questions that would help you to give me better advice. Thanks in advance for any help or advice. I've seen a UFO before. This is real too, with no bullshit. This happened probably about 8 or 9 years ago, and this was a really fucking close encounter too. Posted it here before. I'm not good at writing though, so bear with me. But I'm also not going to spare any details, because like I said, no bullshit. I'll give you the exact location. The time it happened might be scuffed though. I'm 22 now closer to 23, so I was roughly 15. Be 15 year old me. Live in Wales, a country in the UK, it's close to England. I lived with my mother, my younger sister, and my mother's husband at the time, who I'll call John. We have a caravan in England, in a caravan park called Brian Sands. We'd visit it on some weekends, it was a couple hours drive. I hated it because there was no Wi-Fi and my mother and John would usually spend all their time at a bar called The Seagull, so I had the duty of keeping an eye on my sister. Well, they got pissed up all night on beer. This happened almost every day there. We'd later get a taxi back to the caravan real fucking late at night, probably around 12 midnight. Be at The Seagull. It's getting really late, so I convinced my mother to call a taxi back as usual. We get to the entrance of the caravan park. It looked like a maze of branching paths through trees, which led to lines of caravans. On this night, the park was engulfed in thick fog, which wasn't too unusual. UK has shit weather. We exit the taxi from the same place we usually do, marked on the pic related which I illustrated and paint with the best of my memory. The four of us walk to the caravan through the fog. When we get closer to it though, I see lights through the fog, really close to our caravan and wonder what the fuck it is. At this stage, my mother is absolutely wasted as usual. John is holding up better though. I ask him what the lights are and he doesn't know. We get closer to the lights, as they're between us and our caravan, probably only like 5 meters away. This is undeniably a UFO. It looks like a cartoon sort of stereotypical depiction of a flying saucer, and it's not that far from the ground. It's just hovering in place close to our caravan amidst the fog. From memory, it was a large, circular, flying saucer, with a big white light in the middle, and other lights around the circumference, as depicted in Pick Related. I can't think of any other distinguishing details of it. We could only see this from below, and I think the lights around the middle larger light may have orbited around it like it was spinning. However, I'm not certain about this. It happened a long time ago, but I remember some motion to it despite it being seemingly stationary. At this point, we had all gathered under it to look at it. My mother was completely out of it drunk, and my sister was just a little kid, so I was in awe 
clarifying with John that we were actually looking at a UFO. I make sure John gets his phone out so we can get a picture of the UFO. My mother gets her phone out too, but I'm looking through John's as I don't trust her to get a good picture. It looks completely illegible through the phone, as it's really dark out, with fog everywhere through a shitty old phone camera, which makes me really frustrated. My mother and John finish taking the shittiest quality photos of this UFO, and then my mother starts to drunkenly shout, Aliens! Aliens! Come and get me! This causes fear to set in, as I realize we are all directly below a fucking UFO, and now my mother is shouting at it, so I grab her hand and pull her towards the caravan, which we all get inside. As it's late, we all go to bed. I lay in bed, and my mind is racing thinking about aliens coming out and killing us, which keeps me awake for hours. The UFO wasn't actually making any noise while it was in place outside, and throughout the night, I couldn't hear anything out of the ordinary. Next day, it's gone. I remind my mother and John, who are now more sober about the UFO, and we check the photos, which are useless, illegible. The most annoying thing is neither of them cared. It was just like, ah, Haha, <laughs> oh yeah, the UFO. They weren't interested at all. Anyway, this has been in the back of my mind for years. There was a period where I'd recite this experience to my friends who obviously wouldn't believe me. Understandably. And since then, I've asked my mother now and again about it, who still doesn't really care. At one point, I searched for any UFO experts in the UK area that I could talk to about it and ended up emailing someone who had a website and published UFO-related fluff. He emailed back saying there had been reports in the Brian Sands area, but then asked for me to fill in a UFO form or something, which I ignored. Around a year later, I went to a pub with my mother, and we were reminiscing over beers about places and people, and I brought this up again. And she said, Oh yeah, I've probably still got a picture of that on my old phone. So I asked, don't you think about that? I think about it all the time. There could be aliens, or it could be the government. Isn't it scary? And she responded with something like, I've got better things to worry about than aliens and all. So that's that. Today was just another day where it's been on my mind. So I found the most relevant, least dead Fred. Lamau. All ex-Freds are dead. Might post this again sometime. Still haven't become a tinfoil hat schizo, but still have no clarity. Any anons with a Lamau expertise to impart or even questions would be appreciated. Thanks for reading. Classified Swedish documents about an alien base under S range. Found this on two other forums and apparently someone bought a drawer with a hidden compartment in the bottom drawer where there was some classified letter about an alien base under S range in Kiruna, Sweden. It ties to the Swedish phenomenon about ghost rockets, and there is also a video about the guy in the letter that they found dead. Also includes connections to Roswell and some materials that I think Bill Schneider mentioned also. Lots of alleged UFO sightings around that area. Also, there is the fact that LKAB Mining Company is actually moving the whole city of Kiruna due to mining. The documents are translated from Swedish as follows. Home of special significance to security of our country. Hello, Per. Congratulations on the new position. A feather in your cap to an already impressive career. It is especially gratifying that our paths, in a sense, now cross in service. Secret of special significance to the armed forces. This letter adorns the cover of a binder, in which you will find very important information. It is with great trepidation that I hand this over. I am disobeying orders. I wish I could share this with you. There is one thing about Ezrange that very few people know about. It's not something your predecessors saw or knew about. But in your position, decisions may be made that have some bearing on our operation. Now it's so convenient that you got the job. I could never tell this to anyone else, so maybe it's written in the stars. Either way, it's necessary. You are now, in some ways, my boss, but also a close friend. I trust you know the importance of confidentiality when it comes to this information. 
If this information were leaked, it would put me and others in grave danger. I insist that you burn this letter after you have read it. I'll take it from the beginning. Everything you know about my work at Ezrange is untrue. I do work at Ezrange, but not with sounding rockets. Ezrange and the Space Corporation are a cover to hide a colony of beings from another star system. My job is to try, find out, and replicate its technology. I am part of a small team of 23 people. Would they have gone faster with more? No doubt. But the larger the team, the greater the risk of information leakage. The colony has been on the site long before Ezrange was there. As far as we know, they arrived in the autumn of 1946, after sending a large number of probes. By then, they had been traveling for many hundreds of years, studying the unprecedented evolution of human technology. They probably never entered orbit, but arrived directly in a hyperbolic orbit, breaking just above the atmosphere. This was done to minimize their impact, but this required them to send a large number of probes in advance to find a suitable location for arrival. Probes that witnesses in the 1930s and 1940s noted, but didn't realize what they were at the time. We called them ghost flyers and later ghost rockets. The arrival of the colony itself completely passed us by when it happened. In the years before the arrival, the number of probes increased markedly, peaking in August 1946 and then ebbed away completely after they landed in the autumn of 1946. On this basis, on the 10th of July 1946, the Ministry of Defense formed an investigation committee, which was to be called the Ghost Rocket Squadron. The official name is the Defense Staff's Ryland Project Tilcomet, which roughly translates to Project to Come. The committee includes representatives from the Defense Staff, the Air Administration, the Air Staff, the Defense Research Establishment, the Defense Radio Establishment, and the Naval Administration. The Defense Staff's Air Defense Department was responsible for collecting reports from the public and the military. The technical analysis were primarily carried out by staff from the Air Administration. The chairman of the committee was Colonel Bengt Jacobson, head of the Air Administration's Material Department. On the 19th of July, Several witnesses see probes hitting four lakes in Norland. The lakes are investigated by the Misvara, but all they find are craters on the bottom. No wreckage. We believe that they landed the probes in the lake intentionally, but more on this later. On July 22nd, 1946, the defense staff, through TT, urges newspapers not to put name places in their notices. The reason is that the public and foreign powers should not receive any information about the movement of space probes over Sweden. On August 1946, this gets international attention when the New York Times reports the US Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, was very interested in the testimony of the spy rockets over Scandinavia. And on August 20th, two experts in Nereal War from the US land in Stockholm, General Jimmy Doolittle and General David Samoff. In 1947, when one of these crafts crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, a secret organization called Group Zero was formed, on the initiative of Harry Truman. Harry Truman was reportedly frustrated by the problems of filing through the conservative-controlled Congress. He did not trust that politically and democratically controlled processes could handle an event such as an alien craft with the secrecy of it required. The letter required something more stable than a democratic nation, which might be one presidential election away from changing everything. Therefore, the handling of the Roswell rocket was taken away from the military and given to the group, which consisted of some of the military personnel involved in Roswell, members of the Swedish Space Projects Committee, and some multinational corporate executives with a lot of resources. Group F1's aim was to research the alien technology from the ship and slowly leak the findings secretly to humanity through their companies, and if possible, discover if there were more ships and keep them secret, so that they could fully control the flow of technology. But 15 years later, the purpose changed slightly. The year was 1962. Astronaut John Glenn had just completed three orbits of the Earth, and shortly afterwards, the American satellite Telstar was launched. 
This is the first privately funded launch and the first satellite not owned by a government. Officially, this is a communication satellite, but behind it was Group Psi, on board. In addition to communication satellite equipment, it has systems to scan the Earth for radio signals to match those that the Roswell probe appeared to be using. An interesting anecdote is that 1962 is a year which the Soviet Union repeatedly opened fire with nuclear weapons on unidentified flying vehicles high in the atmosphere over the Arctic Ocean. The objects were heading both towards and away from the Scandinavian Peninsula. But we in Group S2 didn't know this when it happened. We only found out in 1983 from a Soviet infiltrator named Mark Trum. It wasn't long before it had picked up a signal. A signal from a deserted area in northernmost Sweden, about 25 kilometers northeast of the small village of Yukushavi. This prompted S2 to act very quickly. With the help of a discreet lobbying campaign, they got Sweden's parliament to pass a law against pirate radio broadcasts that same year. The real reason being to better triangulate the signal without interfering pirate stations in the area. 0110. An agreement is signed in the same year to set up the European Space Research Organization. This would come into force two years later, in 1964. The first thing ESRO did was to set up a fenced area around the newly found site. The area was given the internal name, Extraterrestrial Stationary Radio Anomaly North, Ground Soul Elevation. During construction, a cover was developed. The sonar is still the official explanation of the base's purpose to this day. However, the idea of a huge 5,600 km squared civilian space base on Swedish snark with guards and fences run entirely by a newly established international organization risks raising uncomfortable questions. To make the base's creation and existence a little less conspicuous, ownership was taken over in 1972 by the newly formed Swedish company Rimbogalet, which roughly translates to the spaceship. In the years after 1964, several energy signals were mapped in the area, all concentrated in an area about 470 meters below the Earth's surface. Once the depth and position were established, blasting began underground. The explosive rock that was brought up formed a stone and gravel plateau of about 26 hectares. The official explanation for this one-note plateau is that it is there to send up weather balloons, which it does, mainly to maintain the cover. Many of the people who work with rockets and balloons at S-Range don't know the real purpose and what is going on under their feet. Home of sinofficial meaning for the safety of the picks. The colony itself is circular and shaped like a discus, with a diameter of 3,341 meters. It is centered between a set of Swedish mountains and what is known as Zone A of the S-Range area. It has a hard hull that lies directly against the primeval mountain with a perfect fit. There are no significant natural voids between the colony's hull and bedrock, nor are there any passages to the surface, except for the one we blew up to get down. The hull is mostly non-metallic, but there are exceptions. The central part is a 250 meter wide, slightly raised triangle on top of the colony, which is covered by a jumble of circular patterns of different sizes and of different metal alloys that give it different colors. Our tunnels start with a long tunnel that slopes about 10 degrees down towards the center of the colony. At 450 m depth, straight up, in the center of the colony, we had our house with offices, labs, toilets, and a coffee room the hair base we called the center. Right below the central area, we carved out a cavity between the hull and the rock where we can explore the hull. It is high ceilinged and called the church. From the church, the tunnels branch out into 12 tunnels along the hull in all directions of varying lengths, four of which reach the edges and one of which goes down a bit below the 010 colony and is meant to follow it all the way to the underside center. That tunnel has some way to go before it is completed. The lack of passage up was a great mystery to us at first, for we could observe their probes over the area off and on. 
In Lure, they could send up and take home these without passage through the primeval mountain. The answer came after an incident in June 1979 that cost the life of a dear colleague, or it happened already in January 1979, or August 1980, depending on how you look at it. It began when my colleague and friend, James, was found in June by police, frozen to death a few miles from base. The odd thing was that he wasn't found dead. Not yet. The body they found was stone dead. But my colleague was very much alive and working as usual. But the body was like an exact copy of him, except it was missing a sliver of front tooth. Same clothes and everything. It even had a copy of our coffee pot from the coffee room. The police were puzzled because no one was reported missing, and he wasn't dressed for the wilderness, and certainly not for cold weather. And how did he get out there? There were no roads. The police didn't know that it looked like a copy of James, and when no one was reported missing, they buried the body at a cemetery with the name unknown. We were also puzzled, and although it was very eerie and uncomfortable, we had no theories at the time about what had happened, or rather, what was going to happen. But we worked on as usual, until August 1980, when it happened. We observed a correlation between schismographic disturbances and craft over the Ezringe area, but they were delayed 575 days. So if we saw free craft leaving the area two days apart, we could record free seismic events two days apart, 575 days later. When we found this pattern, we saw our chance to figure out how they were sending them up. We noticed early on that they seemed aware of our working hours, and the previous seismic disturbances had taken place when as few of any of us as possible were on site. So they knew we were there, and they were keeping an eye on us, but this time, we had an idea of when it would happen. So we decided to lie down to sleep at the center, and we were awake when it happened again. We had placed measuring instruments all over the parts of the hull we could access, measuring everything from radioactivity to electromagnetism, sound waves and gravity. All the sensors were connected to the control center, where we sat and monitored everything. After this realization, we moved the center. We blasted out a cavity further up the tunnel so that they are not directly above the triangular part to avoid more incidents of this kind. We also erected a 100m high mass directly above the triangle with 11 evenly spaced measuring points. This mast is thus exactly above the center of the colony. So, how do their probes work? Why do they always land in lakes? And how did they escape someone finding parts of them for so long? And why were we able to find it in New Mexico? It has to do with the alloy they're made of. We've named it Alkalium, but also call it Interstellite, a working name that stuck. Interstellite is an alloy of group 1 and 2 metals in the periodic table, alkaline metals, hence the name Alkalium, and reacts very strongly with water. However, they can actively keep it from reacting, presumably by applying a high voltage to the probe's hull. This has the advantage that if a probe stops working and crashes in the desert somewhere, it will just lie there until the first rainstorm passes by and erases all traces. It also seems to be why they prefer to land the probes in lakes at the end of their missions. They react with water, and all traces are erased. Now, along with the documents that accompany this binder, you know everything you need to know. More than this, oh one, I don't know. One. Your future decisions in the service. This information will serve you well. I hope we can see each other again soon. It has been far too long since the last time. Your friend, Carl. End. Following this, I will attach the documents untranslated from Swedish, if you'd like to take a read. And I will also attach images of the drawer that was found, where the secret compartment where the documents lay hidden. Unfortunately, I don't speak Swedish, so I cannot verify any of this. But maybe you can. Now, as these images roll across the screen, I'd like to say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy your stay, and I hope you return sometime soon. Well, I've been Tetsuya, and I'll catch you on the next one. Unless you're murdered for having secret information on aliens, of course.